Would you stand with me, please, this morning? And as we are walking through the Gospel of John, we will be uh, studying verses 1 through 6 in chapter 4. So, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1052. And God's word says this. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. You may be seated. Now, constantly as the the life of Jesus is retold in the Gospels, we see Jesus running contrary to the ways of the world. He runs against the grain of what people expected the Messiah to do. He constantly is flipping the world on its head. Embedded at the core of this overarching principle is the glorious truth that God the Father has a specific plan to fulfill in his Son. So in every instance that is retold in what happens and why it happens, all of it has to run through this filter of God accomplishing his one perfect sovereign plan in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Every situation was the way it was supposed to be. Every detail of every circumstance that happened was for a reason. Now, when we talk about this, we're not talking about some random chance of fate where everything is for a reason, supposedly, but there is no person behind those circumstances. They're just random action coming from nothing. That's not what we're talking about. It's not like hearing those Hallmark movies where it's constantly said that fate brought them together. No, the purposeful mighty, sovereign God, who is over all creation, is at work in all circumstances, everything, no matter what it is. And what happens in those circumstances all move toward fulfilling this one great plan and purpose. This makes the grace and mercy of God so rich when you really see this and really reflect on this. Because this is God reaching down into a sinful world with his power when he didn't need to. Right? We've talked about this many times. He could have just been just and left us. But he chooses to reach down into a sinful world when he didn't need to. He didn't have to create But he chose to. He didn't have to save. But he chose to. He didn't have to show mercy and give grace to people who were rebels against him. But he wanted to. So all that happens in the course of human history is for the glory of God. For the glory of God alone and the exaltation of his righteous son, Jesus. So that he is on display for all of creation to see. So as we move back into the narrative of events in this gospel that happened in the life of Jesus, we need to see the many principles that are at play. So that we can see what God's truth is and so that we can apply it to our circumstances as we live through our lives. All of these are rooted in two very important truths of God. They're rooted in predestination and providence. 
Predestination, again, is God determining before time began what would happen in time. The exact events in the course of human history as time moves along. Predestination is a word that people do not like in many, many ways. By nature, we repel this idea. But it is a word that we must deal with because it is in Scripture. And we must deal with it biblically. Meaning we must submit to what God says and not what we want him to say if something like this rubs us the wrong way. Often that's the case with a doctrine like that, with a truth like that. It rubs us the wrong way. So we try to manipulate it and turn it around so it's not so abrasive, so we can deal with it. But when we do that, we turn it into a falsehood. Something that's not true. So in a general sense, predestination is that God marked out before time began, beforehand, the events and boundaries of history itself. In a specific sense, predestination is zero, zeroed in on God determining to save those he has chosen to save purely by his grace in Christ. Purely by, by his desire, by his choice that he didn't have to do. It's purely by his grace alone. And this is set forth in scripture constantly. Whether it is a clear cut, obvious front and center truth. Or whether it is more in principle and in the backdrop of a narrative. To put it another way, this truth is either taught outright as doctrine, as teaching. Or it's displayed in the strands of events of a circumstance that connect together as narrative. As we see them fleshed out in real events in human history as they happen. So this brings us to and must connect us to the biblical truth of providence. We've talked about that a lot. Providence, as I've mentioned many times before, is like that architect actually building the house that he has designed beforehand. So this is where these two truths connect so beautifully. We need to see the beauty of these. Get this. Because this is God. And he is glorious, wise, and perfect in all his ways. Imagine if you made blueprints to a house in the exact detail you wanted Purely by your choice alone. No, no influences at all. Your choice alone. You made blueprints exactly how you wanted them to be. And then when you went to actually build that house, you did everything. Down to the smallest detail, you did everything you planned to do. You accomplished everything in that blueprint perfectly. Every little measurement, every little aspect, every little highlight that was in your blueprint was what you actually accomplished in building that actual house. Imagine if you could be that perfect, that flawless, from your design to fulfilling that actual design. To not have to reconfigure something that you may have messed up. To not have to add a little something there to fix something else. To not have something unexpected come up. As you see on these fixer-upper shows, right? They go into a house and, oh, they didn't expect that to be. To not have a new thought that may have been a new idea on the fly that you thought would make it better. But imagine that every detail of the blueprint was flawless to begin with, and then every action in making that exact blueprint into a reality was, compl was accomplished flawlessly as well. That's how predestination and providence go hand in hand. Predestination is the blueprint. 
And providence is the action of building. And in that we see but a portion of the perfect unity in the work of redemption within the perfect triune God of Father, Son, and Spirit. All working to fulfill that same plan with that same purpose and achieving it in a unity of flawlessness. We must see that. We must bask in that beauty, in that perfection. We must just be in awe of what that really means in its truth and then in how it affects and should affect our life. And this is the lens through which we need to see the narrative of Scripture. Every narrative of Scripture. These are the real life occurrences that flow out of the doctrines of God that are taught by God in His Word. That, as we said maybe last week or the week before, is inspired by God. This is God's Word. But this is not how much of the world, which includes much of the church today, this is not how we see things. We have a man centered focus in much of our theology and our practice. So today we're going to see Jesus flipping the world on its head through some of these principles of sovereign purpose that are rooted in what we just talked about. So in our day, in our time today, we will look at, number one, an overview of sovereign purpose that leads us into chapter four. And then two, a testimony of sovereign purpose. And three, the journey of of sovereign purpose as we get into this chapter. So in this overview of sovereign purpose, we'll look at two things. One, some, some interesting contrasts between John 3 and John 4. And then we'll look at a reoccurring theme that is all throughout the Gospels as we see an example of it here that drives us to what the kingdom of God looks like. So what are some contrasts between John 3 and John 4 that help us get an overview of the sovereign purpose of God? First, we know that the main characters of the narrative whom Jesus interacts with are very different from each other. Nicodemus was a very externally righteous person. He followed God's law strictly and tried his best to keep away from gross sin and gross sinners. He was also one who was held high in a position in society. He was one looked up to by many people. In fact, he was the one who was probably looked up to the most at that time. In contrast to him was the Samaritan woman in John 4 who is very unrighteous. By the little that Jesus says about her, we can tell that she lived an immoral, impure life outwardly, which shows us the inward reality as well. She was also of low rank of society. She was looked down upon by much of society. We also see a contrast in when these events took place. Nicodemus came to Jesus at nighttime. Plus, he was the one who came to Jesus. So if we put these two things together, it shows us that Nicodemus came to Jesus in the darkness of his sin and the blindness of his sin. And in doing so, Jesus then confronts his self-righteousness by telling him a statement of truth that struck him right in the heart. Jesus told him, you must be born again, before Nicodemus even asked a question. This showcased the fact that Nicodemus didn't know who he truly was, and how bad his condition really was. He came to Jesus at night thinking he was a good person, a righteous person, but he was blind to the fact that he was not good. And he was not righteous at all in any way, shape, or form. And this struck at the heart as the very core of the issue. In contrast to this, we see Jesus coming to the Samaritan woman. And he came to her during the middle of the day. 
Put this together, it shows us that Jesus came to this woman in the light of his sinlessness and mercy. And she couldn't hide in any darkness. She had nowhere to go. Her sin was already known. In coming to her, Jesus then opens up his mercy and his grace by asking this woman if she could give him a drink. Which was an opening that led him to reveal that he was the true well that sprang with the waters of eternal life, where sinners could come and drink and never be thirsty again. So coming to this woman in this way shows us that this woman really already knew who she was. She knew the depth of her sin by her experience and conscience. So one little comment about her sinful action knocked her whole wall down. Whereas with Nicodemus, there was so much religiosity, so much self-righteousness guarding his dead heart that it took a lot more to knock all his walls down that he had built up. In this, Jesus knew both of them very well without spending any prior time with them because he knew what was in man and he did not need man's testimony about man. So in both cases, he struck at the heart. Because both of them suffered from the same heart condition. But how he engaged Nicodemus was different as opposed to this Samaritan woman. And in all his interactions, he went against the grain of the world. He flipped the status quo, the current culture and the practices on its head. This leads us to a, the broader reoccurring theme that is all through the Gospels. That drives us to what the kingdom of God looks like. What people group was Nicodemus from? The Jews. What people group was this Samaritan woman from? The Gentiles. This is the broader picture that showcases the expansion of God's plan to include the Gentiles in light of how most of the Jews, as the Jewish nation, rejected their Messiah that was to come. We see this even in verse 1, how the Jews were presenting a spirit of rivalry and growing anger toward Jesus and their rejection of him without realizing that he was their promised Messiah. So because of their rejection as the Jewish nation, this then made Jesus turn to the Gentiles and paving the way for the new covenant to explode. And this fits all of these things, these contrasting pieces together in the puzzle and shows us the overview of God's sovereign purpose in his plan of redemption. How he uses all these events of human history to go toward that way. So every detail that came to pass was ordained by God to come to pass in that exact way. And when we put them together, we see that clear as day. We see this clear as day as we see the new covenant emerging from his sovereign will, his choice alone to include a people group who was without hope and without God in the world. Further, we see this in Jesus' testimony of sovereign purpose. Was Jesus' purpose to get caught up in the rivalry and arguments about the law and work salvation? Was Jesus' purpose to come and physically administer the sacrament of baptism? His purpose was neither of these. He came to fulfill the law so that we would not be saved by our own efforts, which is impossible anyway. But he came so that we may be saved by his work, by his merit on our behalf. This is part of why we hear him leaving this situation. It wasn't about competition from a legalistic mentality that viewed human effort as the catalyst to be saved. It wasn't about hanging out in legalistic debate. It wasn't about our work. So when that belief reared its ugly head, he left. He wanted nothing to do with the Pharisees' false religion because man can do nothing in the salvation of their soul. Nothing at all. So Jesus was focused on his mission to secure that very salvation that man cannot do for himself. He was not distracted by the enticement of allowing any possibility for a work salvation mentality. 
So he left. And he left for a reason. Plus, his time hadn't come yet. The Jews were getting more angry with him at this point. So if he stuck around, it could have easily escalated. But it was not his time to go to the cross. A lot of things needed to happen before that. Which, again, points us to God's sovereign purpose in all things. And how he orchestrates all of those things to bring and and accomplish his plan. And because of the rivalry brewing, Jesus' leaving was part of that purpose. That exact purpose. This opens up the opportunity for us to look at his journey of sovereign purpose. In this we see, number one, the direct intention of Jesus. And number two, the humble humanity of Jesus. So in looking at this geographically, the direct route from Jerusalem in Judea to, Gal- to Cana in Galilee, which is where Jesus would end up after this encounter with this Samaritan woman, the, re- the direct route is through the region of Samaria. And the city of Sychar is right along the way. Though this was a common route, this wasn't the route for the Jew to travel. Jews avoided the Samaritan. So the Jew would go over, then up along the Jordan River, along the other side of the river, through two other regions before crossing back over to avoid the Samaritan. What does this tell us? This was a way in which Jesus flipped the world on its head. For a Jew to interact with a Samaritan and go through their area was preposterous. They were the filth. They were the dogs. They were the scum of the earth. They were to be avoided at all costs. They were the impure, the unrighteous. The Jews were to have nothing to do with them. But this was the will of the Father for his son Jesus in his role of redemption. He didn't have to go through Samaria, but but it was necessary that he did. It was necessary that he did to fulfill God's plan. God had people to save. This was a way for God to reveal that he was the God of all people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. He was not biased to any one group, but was merciful to even those who, for a time and for a reason, were said to be without hope and without God in the world. So Jesus came to save that which is lost. He came to call the sinner to repentance. And he came to unite enemies to himself and unite enemies to each other as Jews and Gentiles were enemies of one another. This is the beauty of God's sovereign purpose. He has good, just, and holy intention in everything that he does. And he works all those things for his purpose. Intention that is rooted in his sovereign choice that occurred before the foundation of the world. To show that he is a merciful God to those whose hearts are turned away from him in rebellion. And left to themselves, they would continue down that road. And he is a God who unites former enemies by breaking down their walls of hostility in and through Jesus. So that they can be united as one together in Christ, as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. This is God's sovereign purpose. And we see this happening in these exact events of human history. These principles at play. And a core aspect of how God shows his mercy is that he sends his son who becomes mercy in human form. Jesus was fully human in every way that we are, yet he was sinless. This real, humble humanity of Jesus meant that he experienced everything a human does. Like fatigue and weariness. After all, he was our human substitute. He had to go through everything as our substitute. He needed to trade places with us, and this is one way he did. He was actually tired from his travels. He was actually thirsty. He was actually weary and hungry. He was all these things because he was actually human. 100%. 
as well as 100% God. This was a rough road for him, literally and figuratively. It was not easy for him to get to this Samaritan woman, but he goes after those that his father gave him, no matter what it cost him. And in the end, it cost him his life. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And every sinner that his father gave him to trade places with and save were his joy. If you're in Christ, you're the joy of Christ. He went to the cross for you. In this, in his unexpected lowly life, is another way in how he flipped the world on its head. How we see these principles of God's ultimate sovereignty at play with his purpose and fulfilling that beautiful, glorious, merciful purpose. What's also amazing about this that brings us back to God's sovereign purpose is that Jesus could have kept going like his disciples did as they went for food. But Jesus chose to stop in that exact place that he did. A place that had a connection to the Old Testament testimony about him. As the well of Jacob was a type of Christ that was meant to point to Christ. This is the source of where the central aspect of their interaction revolves around. Jesus being the true well of water that springs forth eternal life was an instrument to, to, to drive this woman to the grace and mercy of God and the blessing that comes from salvation in Christ. The never-ending waters of God's grace, of God's eternal life. And this we will expand on more in the verses to come, but this is mentioned because this is not a random incident in some random place. This was all designed by God himself and fulfilled perfectly by Jesus. The architect's blueprint and the architect's labor united in one and fulfilled to perfection. Do we see this? And do we see the connection of this? Because this just explodes the plan of redemption and the mercy of God himself on sinners who are lost, who do not deserve his mercy, who deserve nothing but wrath and condemnation for eternity. And now as we look at this narrative through these principles of God's sovereign purpose, what are we to further take from this for our lives? How does this apply to us practically 2,000 some years later? Allow me to provide two points of application this morning. Number one, know, love, and rest in the fact that God is at work in everything for your good if you are in Christ. If you have come to life by the sovereign grace of God in Christ, then he is the master blueprint designer who achieves all the details of that blueprint that he designed before time began for your good and his eternal redemptive purpose in and through his son Jesus. Can we think about that practically? What that actually means? That no matter what you face, whether you believe and see it to be good or not, is for his purpose. And he achieves his perfect purpose through you. And all the things that come along your past, path are or, or, or ordained by God. They're for a purpose. And God is good. And God is holy. And God is righteous. So if you think what you're going through is bad, he means it for good. And that's where we rest in this truth that we see beautifully founded upon in scripture time and time again that point us, that root us in salvation in Christ. His predestination and providence are in your favor. If you are in Christ and rooted in him and saved by his grace alone, by what he did on the cross, then predestination and providence are in your favor. 
And as you look back of how I explain those, that is the solid rock that you cling to. That every storm you face will do nothing to you. Though your family may take, be taken away, though your job may be taken away, though your health may be taken away, one thing that can never be taken away from you, your salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. And it's rooted in that. That is beautiful. That is what we need. Uh, just like all the details of Nicodemus's life and this Samaritan woman's life were marked out by God before the foundation of the world. And as theirs were, so were yours, if you are in Christ. So were yours. Everything that has happened to you was planned out by God before the foundation of the world. Think about this. And if we are honest with ourselves, we can look back at our life and see all of those puzzle pieces put together that lead us to the point where God redeemed us in time. And from there, it explodes to the purpose as God's child. Though Nicodemus was pride-filled, self-righteous, and it was a man who relied on his own goodness before God. And that was the real intent of his own heart. God worked that and meant it for good in his sovereign purpose. Everything he went through, every, every achievement, every thought of himself was used by God to bring him to nothing when he came face to face with Jesus Christ and face to face with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though the Samaritan woman was immoral, impure, and an ad adulteress. And that was the real intent of her own wicked heart. Just like in Nicodemus' wicked heart, in a different way. God worked that and meant that for good, for his sovereign purpose. So everything she went through, every choice that she made, was in God's plan. And God used that wickedness as good to bring her to Christ so that Christ would meet her at the well and point her to the wells of eternal life. I can look at my life and see puzzle piece after puzzle piece connect together as God pulled me out of fire after fire, allowed me to do what I did, what I thought, all to bring me to that place where he emptied me out and brought me to his son for salvation. And from there, that explodes to the purpose of God and me as a child of God in his hands, used for his good purposes. So all of their details of their lives before their encounters with Jesus were planned out so that, they, so that those instances would lead them to that exact count encounter at the exact time, at the exact place where they met Christ. If we see this in our lives, then this must increase for us the depth of God's grace for each one of those that he has determined to call to himself to be saved, pure by his choice, purely by his mercy, by his grace. And we see that we should have been rightly left to ourselves. So this just expands this. This increases the depth of his grace. It opens up the great purpose that God has for our future as his children, whom he uses to fulfill his plan and his purpose. It's not our plan. So it's not dependent upon our strength to achieve that plan. And this deals with both their uh, and our sanctification and the building of his kingdom both for our inward cleansing and our inward uh, growing in righteousness and holiness, and in how God uses us in other situations to build the kingdom of God, his kingdom. This should be a tremendous and solid application for us in light of what has been clearly seen from God's word today. 
that God has orchestrated all events of human history, and we see just little pieces of that history happening before our eyes in this account in John 4. This is, again, the filter in which we need to see all of this chapter and all of Scripture, especially when we come to the narrative. The second application, as we close, is driven toward God building his kingdom through his people. In both cases, in John 3 and John 4, Jesus struck at the heart of that individual that he was dealing with. But how he did that was different with Nicodemus as opposed to the Samaritan. He dealt with them differently. He talked to them differently. Jesus knew he was, who he was dealing with. And he spoke to them in a way that reached into their specific life. He took their specific backgrounds into account. But some may object, well, Jesus is God and he knew the heart. So he, of course, he easily does that because he's omniscient. We can't know the person's heart. Plus, that'll take too much time. Neither of these are excuses to strive, uh, to not strive toward following Jesus' footsteps here. Jesus gives a model of how to do evangelism, how to interact with people. Yes, we can't know the heart like God, and we should never think we can. But God has given us his word. And what does his word do? It searches the heart. Plus, in his word, he has given us his truth of how to discern whether or not we, first of all, and someone else is saved. So the heart can be exposed, and it must be exposed. He gives us tests and evidence to go by. And as we've said before, this is necessary for evangelism. This is a, a necessary prerequisite in a way for doing evangelism. is to discern what people's situations are. To try to unpack that heart as much as we possibly can. With all of the tests that God uses in scripture to equip us. And how to, to discern salvation itself and how people come to be saved. So we are to know the heart as much as we possibly can. So that we can love the heart the way that we're supposed to. This is at the core of loving your neighbor as yourself. What's the very core of that? It's the spiritual aspect of the person's life. And does this take time? You bet it does. You bet it does. Take time on our part to study the word of God, to know the gospel, to know what's going on in this world, the beliefs of this world, how they are contrary to the gospel, or how they show evidence of salvation. And we are to take time with people, to listen to their lives, to get to know them as best we can. Maybe you'll have time with somebody more time than not, maybe you won't have any time. You need to be equipped whatever situation that faces you. And we are to be equipped and ready either way, knowing that God is sovereign in all circumstances, especially salvation. And that is so important when we're doing evangelism. So crucial. So following Jesus in this way, the master of evangelism, is the desire of God's people. We want to do what he did in his evangelism and how he unpacks the heart, how he searches the heart. And we use his word by doing that. This isn't easy. It wasn't for Jesus and his humanity that he shares with us. This, again, was a rough road for him. And that's really not a play on words. It was not easy for him to get to this Samaritan woman. But again, he goes after those that his father gave him, no matter the cost, no matter the cost to him. And in the end, again, it cost him his life. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because the joy that was set before him was God's people. And he came to save and save them perfectly. Every single one of them. And every sinner that his father gave him to trade places with and save were his joy. Were his joy. 
set before him. So since there is still time remaining in this world, we are to be reminded that God has people to save, that he has appointed to eternal life. And through the gospel, by, by the Spirit's work, those that he has set apart in Christ, they come to believe perfectly, infallibly. Every person that God has chosen to save before time began will be saved in time as it goes. That's how perfect God is. That's how united the work of the Trinity is in fulfilling this plan. We must see this core principle. This must drive our life. This must drive the purpose of our life, especially in what we're called to do, to preach the gospel. So as the Holy Spirit reminded Paul that he had people to save in Corinth, we ought to be reminded of this truth, even though we do not know who whom we may come across, that God has set apart in Christ to be saved by the Spirit. We don't know who he will save. So we're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel, knowing that God will save perfectly. Every single person. Perfectly. This is the beautiful truth of how perfect God is. And again, this isn't easy. None of this is. The whole Christian life is not easy. And if we think it is, then we either are sorely mistaken or we do not know. And I would maybe lean to the latter in these days. It's not supposed to be easy. It goes against the grain of the world in many ways. And through God's sovereign purpose, he brings glory to himself and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by flipping the world on its head. Don't you want to be an active laborer in this sovereign purpose that I have just barely explained today? Don't you want to be a part of that, an active part in God's purpose? Now knowing more of who he is and what he does, what he achieves perfectly? What does this do to you? What, what does this burden, how does this boil up a burden in you for a lost soul? Are you wanting to be used by God mightily? Because as we may think of maybe men like Martin Luther, he did not think that God would use him to do what God did. That was actually far from his mind. And imagine what God did with somebody like Luther. And we can talk about many, many others. You have no idea what God will do with you, do you? But do you want to know? Do you want to be active in his purpose? Do you want to be used by the powerful, mighty God of all creation who has a specific purpose to redeem sinners in and through his son Jesus? And he does so by the gospel that you are to proclaim, that you are bring, to bring into the world. Do you want to be used by God? If so, labor in God's field. Labor in the study of his word. Labor in knowing him personally. Labor in loving his truth that he has given you. And labor in how you live this life. How you look at this life and what you do in this life. How you talk to people in this life. How you get to know people in this life. Labor in that. Labor in God's field because it is his harvest. It is his harvest. And he will save those he has determined to save before the foundation of the world. Rest in that. And cause them Let that bring you to great activity, purpose, and joy.